Well, hello, welcome to Cleggan Web Demonstrations. So normally you start webinars where I'm sitting at a desk and you're seeing slides. You don't get to see me, and I apologize for that. I have a face for radio. Uh, but today, because we're going to do live things, myself and Brian, Hi. we're actually going to do this live. So this isn't our lab. It's very similar to our lab. Our lab is closer to what you think of as your factory. So when you go into your manufacturing cells, that's what our lab cells really look like. But this is pretty similar. But we're going to actually test or both at least all the test steps for a real product. So today, the main thing here is actually to go through how you test a complex product for restricted materials. So we grab our product from today. We just got this at a local retailer. Um, we just picked this up. So this is what we're testing today. It's a coffee machine. Um, it's actually reasonably complex. I'm gonna show bits of it. There's actually more to a coffee machine than one would think. There's actually even less in some cases and more in other cases. So we're gonna actually test it. One of the most common questions we get for restricted materials is how do you test something complicated? Most people use the test standards for single materials or liquids. They're not as fluent in test standards for complicated things, components, products. This is a full coffee maker. We're not going to sit here with a grinder. We're not going to whip out a grinder today and just dump it in. By the way, you might have noticed that I actually make a lot of hand motions. I'm a hand talker. Um, a lot of you guys are used to me being on site. I'm using a suit. Uh, this is more me in the wild. This is uh, sort of me in nature. Um, but I'm actually a hand talker. And he talks very fast. And I talk very fast. So I mentioned before. So try to slow him down. We all have stretch goals. <laughs> Anywho. <laughs> so, <clears throat> big thing about this, of course, being a hand talker, uh, we're going to be very demonstrative. But do you realize, today is a web demonstration, but whenever we're doing a normal slides one, I'm actually making all the same hand motions. I'm gonna have some pretty probably accessible ones later. I'm actually doing the same thing. So it's funny, even when they're on the slides and I'm talking probably way too quickly, I'm actually doing hand motions the entire time I'm doing normal web meetings. I can't help myself, it's like that. It's so, true. yeah. It's true. So we're gonna test this fellow today, uh, quite complicated. Um, so Brian's in the lab, he's gonna do a lot of the useful things. I'm gonna do a lot of the talky-talky, but he's gonna actually explain a lot of what he does. Um, we're looking very sciencey today, so it's very nice. Um, so this is what we're testing. Um, what we're going to use is another piece of equipment, definitely XRF, FTIR. We're going to talk about wet chemistry. We're going to talk about GCMS. We're going to talk about engineering analysis. It's going to be pretty fluid. Um, but this is actually what we do. So this is not what we start with. Well, we start with this. You get a picture of that. When it first gets here, everything is tracked. There's a tracking code for everything. This way, we know where everything is, of course. Um, as things move through the lab, we follow the tracking code. And we have the entire history of everything your product's ever done when it's here. So one of the next things we have to do, of course, is that's wonderful, but you have to really know what you're testing. So here's the product itself and it's wonderful, but this is not what we test. We don't test this full unit. We don't grind it up or take some open shots. We try to dismantle as much as possible to single materials. Now that's not always the case. You're going to have a lot of composite materials, things with coatings, paint, things that are very small. So you we have rules for composite materials, we'll talk about it as we go through, that are different from single materials. But the point is to try to take this thing apart to the point where we're really testing single materials or composite materials, but as simple as possible. The problem with doing that though, is we get down to single materials and you're like, what is that red thing? So one thing we have to do, if you don't mind, oh, Brian opened it up, it's wonderful. So I'm gonna show this and then we're gonna have a close up of it. So this is the bottom. This is also not the way we test it. We still have to dismantle it more. However, we really need to take a picture of it. So if you ever get a picture of it, in the test report, there's usually an exploded picture. Um, you can see down the bottom, my bottom right, is a picture of this. This will be the test report. And one of the reasons for this, this won't have any test results related to anything in that picture, from that picture, it needs to be dismantled more. However, if you look in there, you'll see some little red bits. I can show right there, it's little red bits underneath it. And so when we test later, you're going to see a little red thing. And the little red thing, imagine, because red often has cadmium. Uh, this one doesn't. But red can often have cadmium. It's a very common pigment for red. But this little plastic thing has cadmium. Our customer's like, well, where did that come from? So we do exploded diagrams to go through. Now what we're testing here, if we go back to focusing on this, the this is coffee machine, it is not necessarily as complex as your products, but it has a lot of the main complexities. It has your circuit boards, has your wiring, has uh, some tubing, a variety of different tube holders and clamps. 
It's got a variety of strange plastic items, which you like strange plastic items, gaskets, and of course, the mythical twist tie. The twist tie is often the root of all evil. Bad. A lot of people, bad. bad. A lot of people take a lot of effort, and more and more these days, to make sure there are no phthalates or short chain chlorinated paraffin in the power cord. What gets often lost in the mix is this twist tie, which is PVC itself, actually. So when you're looking at if you spent all this time and effort and work with your design crews and manufacturing to make this compliant, where a lot of companies fall apart, is here. It's not the final, yeah, the final stuff. Final stuff. It's probably not even on the bomb. This twist tie might not even bomb on the bomb for this product. Now, it's not scope of ROHS for Europe. This product, of course, is bought here in Canada, so ROHS doesn't apply anyways. But this still is in scope of reach. It's still in scope of the Canadian prohibitions of short chain chlorinated paraffins, the EU persistent organic pollutants. So it's still a big part of it. You also get to see lots of neat stuff in here. This is typical. A lot of products are always really neat. A lot of products have a lot of ingenuity. One of the ingenuities in this is, of course, you have this power cable that people might pull or yank out. And you don't want it disconnecting from the circuit board. It's in there. So they actually tied a knot right there in the power cord so it can't go through the little hole. Kind of a neat little simple ingenuity. Another one, and from a lot of other testing, which is kind of interesting about the 10 and 12 cup big coffee pots, is the heater element. So this is not really a current restricted material, it's just really a point of interest. Um, since I have you a captive audience, I get to talk about stuff. So um, this is the heater element. Now, a lot of people don't understand a coffee machine, there are two things that need to be heated. The water, coffee, obviously. People don't really like cold coffee. Well certain places and then the heater element the actual where you put the pot so the pot and the water have to be heated and the way a lot of them save money nowadays to make it simpler is the water heating elements attached to the heating element underneath it they're all one thing now the downside of that is they have to use aluminum for that because stainless steel is not good enough thermal conductor so when you have your you do your tea in a kettle and the kettle takes forever and a day to warm up um, it's because of the stainless steel element it's slower but it'll heat the water this one is much faster, and it's getting the heat from the element below it, so it's aluminum. One of the downsides of aluminum, as people have tried to get away from lead in our water supply, many cities have raised the pH of the drinking water up to closer to pH of 10, which unfortunately aluminum dissolves at pH 8 or higher. So one of these construction problems is you tend to get more aluminum in your coffee than you really originally planned. But I went through a little sideways, which is going to happen a few times, um, but this is what we're testing. But we're not testing it in this form. So the next stage is Brian will show us him actually dismantling what it looks like all dismantled up. Is it perfect? So that's great. It's exploded diagram. We're going to move to the way we actually do it in real life. So the other challenge is we're going to make measurements, which is awesome, and they'll have results, which is also awesome. But if you can't tie it back to the part, not so awesome. So this is how we actually tie a lot of the parts together. You're going to see coming down right overhead. This is a good portion around the heater element. It's a whole bunch of pieces. Um, and Brian can explain what he did here. So yeah, I just basically took everything that Bruce showed you and took it apart as best I could right down to single components. Um, initially, I'm trying to, I'm looking for things like phthalates and wires, I'm looking for mercury, I'm looking for cadmium, uh, specifically like Bruce pointed out, things that are red, things that are um, squishy, basically. Um, and as well, just checking all the aluminum, checking to make sure that everything is as it's supposed to be. So I've broken everything down and to, to all the single parts. What I'm also trying to do when I take those exploded shots from the beginning is when we give this to engineering, engineering has to have a map to follow exactly what we did so they can trace everything back. So inherently the client can see exactly the footsteps that we're taking to take everything apart and get the, the right information to them. So with this part specifically, this is the metal parts that I've done. So I've taken it apart and now I'm just basically going to run some of this on our Niton and we're going to get some results. We can show you. So I'll explain. So what we have here is you notice um, the setup here. Every single part here is going to be tested. Um, whether plastics, or ceramics or metals, we all have a process and everything gets tested. As much as we're looking for certain things at this point in time, we're not really looking for anything. We're following the same process, whether it's metals, ceramics, plastics, each one has a process that we follow. We try to test to get every single material. Now, some cases they're not. This is obviously not a single material. It's got a plastic type material over copper wiring. That's a composite material. But if we dismantle it any smaller, we don't get enough counts back and the measurement has its own inconsistencies. So we have a whole process around composite materials. We use 
different limits. This is really screening. So what we're doing today is screening, which the objective is to either say it does have something, it possibly does not, and it could be it's in an inconclusive range. It's in a range where it has a value, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a pass or fail. We have, in this case, a composite material. It doesn't, a lead result of a 500 or 600 ppm, which is at face value pass, isn't necessarily pass. It's a composite material. So we have rules for that. We'll also end up measuring in much more complicated things like sulfur and chlorine, not just usual RHS substances, because they provide us information on whether something may or is not present. So we're going to do all of this. We test every single thing here, moving all the way through. We do every single piece as we go through, including some legislations like REACH and so on. We do all the packaging, labeling, everything gets done. So we're going to test one of the metal parts right now. So this is going to be on a niton. And as Brian sets it up, so this happens to be an XRF. We have a number of different types of XRF. This is the workhorse. Um, there are many other units that are very similar by their manufacturers. Um, they all do very similar things. An XRF unit, though, is like a teenager. They can be really useful, but they lie to you sometimes. So we have a variety of rules and processes around their inconsistencies. At least the way they're challenging or can be inconsistent is very, very common. So we have to do a tremendous amount of validation work. There's a lot of validation testing, interlab testing. We also do a lot of interoperator testing. If the process is very complicated, we want, if 10 people test the same product, we want to get the same result. So we do a lot of work there. The test standards we use are decent. However, they have a lot of leeway. They could be right. They're right about 99% of the time, which for us, a one in 100 error is not sufficient. We test over 500 parts a day. A 1% error would be five errors a day. So we've upgraded through a lot of validation all the main test standards for screening. So we're down in the 0.01% error rate. So quite a bit better. So we're gonna show some test results. You test it right here, explain it. Yeah, so this is the, I basically took the metal clamp. Um, it looked pretty shiny to me. So just for demonstration purposes, um, we put it on. Um, from my understanding, one of the things we're looking at is chromium. So one of the things here in this, so lead looks great, cadmium's great, mercury's great. Gold we're tracking because gold has the ability to block X-ray beams. So we need to know if it's there because gold is a expensive replacement for lead. So if it's gold plated, it will block the same level going below it. So we have different process rules when it appears. And one of the neat ones is chromium. And a lot of the face value standards say, hey, that's a chromium risk. You could have hex chrome. So, we don't use chromium from the X XRF because we're not regulating chromium. Chromium is not what's regulated, it's a chromate. It's a chromium oxide. So we use actually test swabs here. They use the same chemicals as the official test. The problem with the IEC test is they're well, extraordinarily flawed. Um, they are only for uncoated or unfinished metal. And one of the challenges with that is that they won't cut through paint. So a lot of people use a test standard that won't work in all situations. These materials, uh, this swab as a much better solvent. It won't give us a number, but it's far more sensitive. It'll tell us if hex chrome is there at all. It's really, really effective at that. And there's a hell of a lot of validation testing we have to do with it um, to prove it works or better. The other problem with the official test standards is they're allowed way too much error. It, a lot of the actual limits are based on some initial variations between laboratories, not their ability to measure, but the inaccuracies between lab created a standard. When you do a sort of boiling water test or anything similar, the IEC tests, for hexavalent chromium, there's a limit of 0.1. And people think, hey, that's 1,000 ppm. Nope. It has to do with the error rate. It's 0.1 uh, per centimeter squared. 0.1% um, per, cent per centimeter squared, not cubed. And it is the number is not correlated to 1,000 ppm. There's no correlation. This has to do with when they did the testing, this was the most, with the variation between labs, that was the lowest level they could easily confirm they could test to. In reality, 0 0.05. And so what the 0.1 is based on in the other test standard is based on what they could reasonably measure to as a minimum test limit. Basically, hex chrome is banned. If they find it present in the test standard, it's a fail. The only difference is, is they don't report anything below 0.1. So normally when we do um, the, the boiling water test and more official test, when it, it applies, which is only uncoated metal, we report to a much lower level because it's not allowed to be there. 
There's a lot of ROHS non-compliance we see all the time because the hex curl is between 0 0.05 and 0.1. Um, the official test standard is a mess and really shouldn't be used. What we want to do is we don't like mistakes. We don't like a test standard that doesn't work. We have the ability to use it, and we do use it only when it applies properly. This screening method is far better. So I'll show an example here. Okay. I can't so, pull it out. Oh, yep. there we go. So we just broke it right now, but normally there's two vials in there. One vial is powder, one vial has liquid. These, the powder is the same reactive chemical that's in the IEC standard. The, the liquid, though, has more solvents. It has acidic solvents and it has um, nonpolar solvents, more like farsol or acetone. So it dissolves paint and dissolves metal. It is a very effective, effective way to make a measurement. It can actually measure or test through. So when you wipe it on something, we'll show it wipe in a moment, there's actually more to this process. We have to ensure it's working and the variety of other steps. But basically when we wipe something, if it has hexavalent chromium, it will turn pink. And even the smallest level, so Brian's just getting it worked in to make sure the liquid's flowing. So officially in the lab, we have a slightly different process or more extended process to prove it's working. But then we wipe apart, and if it doesn't turn pink, hexagon chromium is not present. It doesn't give us a number. There we go, perfectly clean. But it's far more effective. The error rate for this measurement is much, much lower than the official standards. We can't handle internal the error rate of the official standards. So we do use it in conjunction, the official standards, when we make detections, when it's appropriate, an uncoated metal. But this can handle painted samples, it handles handles unpainted samples, it can handle multi-layer, anodized, it's really, really effective. So, we're good. So, now, good. so we got brown, of course, it'll, it's, it's a solvent, so it'll take off paint, it'll pick up every color there, but it's the pink that matters. And there's a, like everything we do, there's so much validation testing, and for something like this, interoperator validation. If everybody's testing the same part, the same way, they should get the same answers. So that's a big part of the validation. So one of the next steps, that was X-Ref. Now, here internally, we don't want to have one out here. If we get an inconclusive value, say for cadmium, say 130 ppm, that for us, especially in a composite sample, is not a fail. We have process rules. So for metal, once we've done the testing, we follow the process chart. So if we can bring out the process chart. So this is for metals. Um, we only show so much here. So basically what we have here is the operator, this is one of the reasons why we do interoperator studies. We want to make sure that every operator who does the work gets the same result. So they follow the same flow chart. There you go. Wonderful. Uh, there's a little Vanna White in here. Vanna White? Oh, it's a good resin. We go through this and depending on the result, it goes different directions. So one of the most common ones is cadmium, 130 ppm. At face value, that's a fail. But for us, it's not a fail yet. Even more common is 80 ppm cadmium is a pass, but it's not. It's in a range of uncertainty. So what we take from that is we follow the chart, it actually will say move to the high definition XRF. So we don't have one of our high definition XRF units in here, they're in the lab. And the high definition XRF has a further chart, it's more accurate. The downside of it, it has a smaller spot size and it has its own teenage years problems. It has its own inconsistencies, but what we've qualified it for, it's superb. So it's what we use for referee. If it is still inconclusive after you use HD, then we go on and do ICP. And ICP is the most accurate way to do it, but it involves basically dissolving the sample and measuring by ICP. It's very time consuming. We call this a follow-up test, and we'll explain those later. So that's that flow chart. That was metals. Awesome. One of the most interesting ones to do is plastics. Now, the plastics in here are interesting enough. We're gonna test the sample right now, a plastic sample. The plastic samples are fascinating on this product. However, this product is designed really well. So even in this jurisdiction, it passes, but even in Europe, most of the, the parts here would pass. There's pretty well everything. So what we're gonna show is a part from a different product that could be in this, but it's not. This the next measurement is not from this product, but it is not an atypical sample. So if you put the, the other sample under the camera, what you also notice is um, he's pulling out of a bag. Everything that moves to the next step, that flow chart also tells us when we bag and for what. We also identify what we're labeling for. And there's labeling. The photo number is there. There'll be a long 2,000, 24,000 number on there. Dash three is the number we had on the chart. So um, we're going to test this. So it's going over to the XRF and doing similar measurements. Now in this case, it's a different mode in plastics. Part of our validation is these units aren't, the XRF units don't fire in one mode. They operate in multiple modes. And they, different things for heavy elements like lead or medium elements like cadmium, 
or when you get down to way up the periodic table like aluminum and sulfur and phosphorus there are different modes so a lot of what we actually validate here is running in a different series of modes that handles different materials so right now of course we're looking very heavily at lead and chlorine if we're looking different at sulfur we have a second mode when they follow the plastics flow chart which you follow later if we're interested in sulfur which for reach sdhc and many other and prop 65 we're quite interested in because of the presence of 2-MPT and, and some of the new um, sulfur-based SVHCs, it tells us whether it's not there. If we get a sulfur reading, it means it could be there. So an interesting one about this one, what's interesting about this one? Uh, it's a lot of lead. So this is a PVC sample, and we saw it under these, the screen. Yeah. This is a red PVC water mill. Like, okay, what's lead from? Is it from solder under the PVC? So what we often have to do is dismantle it further to prove what it is. But this is actually, in this case, from the PVC. So there's two interesting things on this. There's the lead level, which is that thing that glows red. But if you go down about five lines, you'll see the chlorine level, 300 and some thousand ppm. That means it's seeing a heck of a lot of chlorine. So we're looking at PVC. So it tells us two things. A, we have lead, and B, we have PVC, or in our bucket of things that qualifies PVC, for testing, polychloroprene, often called neoprene. It's likely to be PVC, but a flow chart, the test person doesn't have to make a decision, that chlorine means it's gonna be identified as PVC, and there are additional steps. What's also interesting is the lead. The lead is there because it's actually the stabilizer in the PVC. Historically, uh, dibasic lead stearate, so lead soap, was the stabilizer in plastic. Um, one of the problems with PVC is it, it actually deforms the temperature, the durometer or softness changes on the temperature. So as things get warmer or colder, the wire would change softness. So they put a stabilizer in there. Used to be dibasic lead, lead with soap, lead stearate. Nowadays, usually a zinc stearate, a zinc soap, um, but this is either an older wire or very cheap. Um, again, not from this coffee pot, this is a different system. And you can see the lead, fail, very common failure. Lead in PVC is a very common failure. But it also has chlorine. Now. Ignoring the lead part right now, it would be moving to another step. So we have a plastics process, which I'll show. So lovely one, this is a typical failing part, typical failing PVC, not from this coffee machine. It's actually quite decent. So if you look, we have a plastics process, what they follow, and it's quite complicated, and what you can't see, so let's move a little bit closer, um, that depending on the regulation, everything's color-coded, and there are different color codes which regulation because their decision making is different. Um, if we're not doing Prop 65, we're not worried about 2MBT, um, so on and so forth. There are different materials that are different importance. So they follow that flow chart. From that flow chart, it also identifies what they bag for. So as we saw earlier, the sample we had, bagged, it's going to another step. So this is the first part of screening. XRF are wonderful. Again, they're like teenagers. Um, they can be really useful, but they lie to you sometimes. So we have to have a lot of rules. And that flow chart has a lot of rules in it through a lot of validation through testing a lot of parts. We've tested hundreds and hundreds of thousands of parts. It provides us a much bigger data set to cut down on the 0.1%, 0.01% occurrences, the rare things that occur. Things like the way gold shows up as mercury, the way uh, gold, again, can block the signal, so on and so forth. So one of the things that go that one bag, the next step for it is to actually move and test by FTR. The XRF do elements. They do the periodic table. They do... They don't do carbon and oxygen, but they do chlorine and lead and cadmium and all these things. So, but they don't tell us anything about the organics. They don't tell us about phthalates. So this is PVC. So it goes to another step on the FTR. The FTR is an infrared spectrometer, which Brian's gonna use. It doesn't do elements. It doesn't tell us sulfur. It doesn't tell us lead. What it tells us is the bonds, the organic bonds and their structure. So what we're gonna look at here is PVC. So we'll test a piece of PVC on the FTIR, it's not destructive, it gets squished in there. Uh, this is one of our many FTIRs, this is one of the production units. We also have a bunch of traveler units, a lot of people have seen. A lot of equipment we have here, if you have a big expensive product, we often come on site. Actually, what we're doing a lot of cases right now for Skip is we're doing evaluations with the customer like this remotely and explaining their product and what they're gonna have to declare visually. It's, it's the best of available right now when everybody's working remote. So we'll bring up the Spectra. And what we've got here is the full spectrum. Now, at this point in time, people are like, oh, do you bring engineering over to interpret over the peaks? Oh, goodness, no. Um, 
That's not the way production works. You need something that has numbers that's repeatable. So when we do an interoperator study and 10 people do the same measurement, we'll get the same results. So everything has to be numbers based. So this spectrum is wonderful, but we're really looking for something in particular. Very close to where you see the mouse right now, you'll see this double peak, almost a McDonald's symbol. And that's what we're looking for. And what this is, is when you have phthalates, phthalates aren't necessarily bad. Polyester that you wear is a phthalate, it's a terephthalate. The ones we're interested in are orthophthalates. Orthophthalates, ortho means arms on the same side. I know it's weird. Ortho, same side. Terra is opposite sides. Like pterodactyl. Perfect. So when I do a webinar normally with slides, uh, I'm actually doing the same hand motion. So when I, I'm talking about ortho, same side. Terra, opposite sides. I am literally doing the same ones. He on walks it. around the office like that. Fair enough. So the reason that's important is the ortho side has this benzene ring sticking off its butt. And what's happening is the, the double bonds for the carbon that are close to the, to the two arms are pulled one way, and the ones on the ring on the far side are pulled differently because they're much farther from the arms. So it ends up being two peaks for that. So there, one peak is the one close to the arms, and the opposite side of the molecule away from the arms has a different peak. So that's why there's two bumps, and we're looking for them, and they're very specific. When you're dealing with a terephthalate, they don't have the double bumps because they're all equidistant from one of the arms. They're slightly different places, so we can tell the terephthalates apart. So when we tested that power cable I showed the knot in it from that product, it didn't have this double pump, double bump. It is terephthalates. It only had a single. It's a little hard to explain terephthalates. We're just going to talk about ortho. So the way this works, you'll see two peaks there, and we're looking for phthalates, orthophthalates, not just phthalates. We're looking for orthophthalates. And to be an orthophthalate, or more importantly, to be that this material's main plasticizer is orthophthalates, there has to be a peak at 1580 plus or minus 3 and 1600 plus or minus 3. So the number the operator records is related to those two peaks. Now, if they're not there, it doesn't mean phthalates aren't there. What it means is the orthophthalates are not the main plasticizer, and the rules change. Phthalates can still come through, orthophthalates can still come through the colorant, and they'll be at such a low level, a couple, we don't measure in this one down to 2,000 ppm. So when it's 1 or 2,000 ppm, contaminant levels, this won't pick it up. We have a process step to handle that. It'll get tested for certain phthalates. What this does mean, if it's not the primary phthalate, or the main plasticizer, if the orthophthalates are not the primary plasticizer, you won't have short chain chlorinated paraffins and bisphenol A. They're very related at a low concentration to the main orthophthalate plasticizer. If the orthophthalate plasticizer is in high concentrations, there will be usually above 1,000 ppm SCCPs and often a higher level of BPA, BPA being an antioxidant for DHP plasticizer in PVC. But if they're not there, phthalates can still be there at a low level and we'll still do testing for that. We have another step, another follow-up step, but it's not required for SCCPs. We have long validation and, what, and both technical, why it's true, and then testing a very large number of parts in the wild. So control samples are wonderful and we use them for everything. However, the most important ones for us are products in the wild, like we're testing today. Real products that have real materials and cheapness to show us what really exists. So um, if these peaks are here, A, it means an ortho phthalate is present. It doesn't necessarily mean it's one of the ROHS ones. It might not even be the extended California Prop 65 list, but it means an ortho phthalate is present. It also means there's a potential that short chain chlorinated paraffins are present because they're the secondary plasticizer for DHP or DINP, either one. Also, bisphenol A is commonly an antioxidant for DHP and PVC, so it could also be here. So at this point in time, we're not just concerned about phthalates, we're also concerned about SCCPs and BPA. We have other processes to determine whether this is fluorinated, whether it's a fluoral polymer under PFOA, um, EPDM for dichlorine plus, but right now we're focusing on the simple one. So we have many processes. From that, it would move to the next step. So this would now go to follow-up testing. So this part gets bagged, and it'll continue on to get tested by GCMS. Now we don't have a GCMS here today, and that's a longer explanation. Um, basically, the chemicals get extracted in the solvent, and then it free flows or bubble, it extracts in the solvent, and then tested in a gas chromatography mass spec. The chromatograph, as it drips down the chromatograph, tells us what species it is, what chemical it is, and the mass spec, by bombarding and breaking up to constituents pieces, tells us how much. So the next step, the GCMS, our follow-up test we do afterwards, tells us what orthophthalate is there and how much is there. So that's a follow-up test. So 
We've looked at a main part of our testing today. We've looked at XRF. We've looked at FTR. This is all the screening part. And the screening is about 98% of our testing. That part would go on to another step, the one with the little PPC part we saw, will go to another step for phthalates, for short chain chlorinated paraffins, for bisphenol A. But the other materials won't move forward. Or they have to be for another reason moving forward. So a variety of things get tested, get screened, about 97, 98% of our problems are dealt with here. Now, when you get to reach SVHC and more complicated things, one of the next steps before follow-up, everything has to be reviewed by engineer. There are more complicated chemicals. One of the most common ones, and their flowchart handles it, is the siloxanes, which are the building blocks of silicone. So silicone rubber is normally made from siloxanes, and if you don't cure the silicone completely, you'll have above 1,000 ppm D6 siloxane. So one of the next steps after this is done and transcribed, and we also have software internally to double check one of the important things is we just made a measurement. That's amazing. But this measurement you see here, or saw here in the double peaks, has to get to you in a useful way. So what we do is we identify and record whether those peaks exist and then communicate in a test report. But it's not useful in isolation. It has to be correlated to the part. So we'll show the board again, explain why this is all like this. So if we do the overhead of the board, there are parts here. And each part has a number. And when we take a picture of this, the photo will have a number. And what, we're try what we do eventually is the photo, the photo of this one is 62601, and this is part one, part two, part three, part four, and the test data has to be correlated to that. It's not useful to say, hey, you know what, we have a failure. You have to know it was this wire. This wire is fine, by the way. But it has to be this wire or that part. So it correlates on what's on here. Now, a couple years ago, we moved to Lego. You can see this wonderful Lego sheet. Lego is very advantageous. Um, the X and Y are very, very clear. Everything is straight. As much as we try to put things by hand, it's hard to be that straight. It's very straight. Also, as the other bonus, and you can see like this little ball, which is very rolly, uh, the Lego uh, little prongs, little bumps, hold it in place. So this gives a nice XY. It's also gray background. If you watched uh, basketball in the last little while, which you, obviously not this week, but previously, and you watched the Brooklyn Nets, um, you'll notice that they have a gray arena floor like this, and everybody in colors, or any colored jersey, pops. It's all there. It's amazing. It's amazing. It just pops right out. So it's amazing the Lego, this gray, things pop out more than it does white. So it's actually really, really useful. Uh, we've done this for a long time. But we want when we get a result, we want to go back and say, hey, look, it's uh, photo 62601-15, like this one, and then have results. But then we have that exploded picture we saw earlier, so you know where this little red bit came from. So the photo in front of this has a picture of the bottom, so you go, hey, that red bit is actually from the end of the heater home. So it's really helpful. And this is a lot of ways how we, this is how we handle uh, complex products. Um, each process, so let's look through the process charts again. Every single thing we measure, we'll go through different process steps. Uh, everything has a rule, and there's so much validation involved over this. So whether you have a plastic sample, which has a complicated rule, or we have a metal sample, everything goes through a flow chart. But first of all, we have to dismantle it like we showed there. Then from that data, that's awesome. We have pictures, we have data, we have numbers. It's awesome. We don't have conclusions yet. We don't have answers. So what happens next is engineering reviews it. And it's very important, first we have a piece of software that double checks that every photo and every result is what it's supposed to be. As the results are transcribed, not the actual electrical test data, that's all that's just ported over. But the photo number, the, the, the item number on the Lego sheet gets transcribed over. One of the biggest quality challenges for anyone is human error. So, or handwriting. And, uh, and we have uh, both uh, men and women in our lab, uh, but not all the men have great handwriting. Some do. Some do Mine's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> so fives and twos get mixed up. So a piece of software which double checks everything and tell whether every single sample or picture that's supposed to be a data point is there. If not, it kicks it back and identifies exactly what to correct. So it creates really good double checking. Then it takes the data and amalgamates it into a worksheet for engineering. So this is an internal worksheet. Um, and the engineering work off uh, a particular worksheet. So all the data we have still has to be double checked by humans. They have to go through everything, verify the risks, and identify and agree with the conclusions and moving forward. We also have to create the conclusions which go in the test report. So the next step is engineering. There'll be a sheet there. Um, this is another worksheet they use. It's not the test report. The test report is, is far more structured in terms of results. This is a working sheet for engineering. So the engineer works through this. 
to work towards the conclusions or at least confirm or double check. Everything we do is so much double checking. Uh, Rich reminds me to switch away from engineering. There will be a Q&A process, probably a lot of questions, which is fine. This is a very complicated process. Anybody has any questions, we forgot to mention early on that you can put them in the control panel. It's a question section. Just put a question in there. We're going to go live afterwards. Um, go over the questions. So this section, because of the internet instabilities we mentioned earlier on or before it was started, um, this part's recorded uh, because the variety of internet instabilities with everybody VPNing, working from home, is creating in the world. Um, recorded this one, which is rare for us. We're normally live. Uh, but the Q&A at the end will be live. And we preferred this one to be live, but with a lot of the internet instabilities, it made more sense to do it recorded, making sure it works for sure, not drop every few seconds. Um, and then do the Q&A live at the end. So if you have any questions, please put it in the control panel. There'll be lots of questions here. So this is a lot of what we tested, is how we test normally. How many products, Brian, do you think you've tested this year? Uh, I'd say upwards of 100, I would say. Usually the average, if some projects are a week, long, sometimes they're two weeks long, sometimes they're a day. So on average, I'd say we go through one or two a week, so 100, multiply that by 54 in a lab. So yeah. There's a lot of projects. There's a lot of projects, a lot of people working right there. You see a lot of things, a lot of things. <laughs> Open your eyes a lot. A lot. It's one of the things about testing, is when you, you turn over rocks, you find creepy crawlies. So there's a lot of things to do find, but it is one of the most definitive ways to get results. And this is you're basically saying, hey, look, I only have a supplier data is not complete, or I need to sell this product. I just want to be compliant with the requirements. It's especially for new products, it really makes sense to test them. They're already being tested for safety, for EMC. It makes a lot of sense just to test it for this, get it done with, get the report, so you can place it on the market. Legacy products are more difficult because it's, they don't necessarily have the same budget for testing. So a lot of companies do is they test representative models um, to show the process is working. So if something does go wrong, because I mentioned before, human error is a huge factor in this whole industry, not just testing, but manufacturing, that if anything goes wrong, there's really no penalties for it. So, um, we saw engineering. The next step for a lot of them would be some additional follow-up tests, GCMS. GCMS is a much longer gas chromatography bass back. It's a much longer topic. We probably handle it separately. And that provides us for a specific organic, the quantity and the exact species. Like, so the test we did before and says, hey, there's an orthophthalate here in high concentration. Which orthophthalate and at what concentration is next test GCMS. And they all get amalgamated in a test report, which we eventually end up with a conclusion. So, um, very typical one here, the example one, you end up with results. Now, conclusions are not always pass fail. They're not wishy-washy. For example, reach SVHC having lead about 0.1% by weight in brass is a declarable, but it's not a fail. So we have to identify difference between what's compliant and what will be compliant as long as you meet your obligations. So lead at 0.1%, say 0.3% in brass is a pass for ROHS under exemption 6C. But for REACH, it's not a fail, but it's a non-compliance if you don't communicate it. And as of January 5th next year, you don't put it in the skip database. So um, it has, provides specific conclusions, which are not always pass-fail because some of the regulations aren't pass-fail. They're as long as you declare, like Prop 65 or REACH SVHC properly, you're compliant. That's the big part of what we did here today. A lot of examples. Again, there'll be a Q&A. Now, there aren't any slides after this one uh, or send outs. Normally in a presentation, of course, you don't see me. Thank goodness for you. Um, and we send out slides. There's no slides for this one, but feel free to ask questions. Um, this is a bit of a complicated process, and we went over a lot in a very glossy way. Um, there's a lot of validation testing. That's why our process is a very complicated what you don't know is what's most likely going to hurt you. So what you don't know in your product could affect your compliance. For us, what we don't know about problems with the machine could affect us. And that's why we do a tremendous amount of validation testing and upgrading the processes. We've determined over time some of the basic IEC processes that just don't cut it. They're good, but they're not perfect. And we can't handle good. Again, if a test works 99% of the time, it's not useful for us. We do over 500 measurements a day massive amount of screening, follow-up testing. If we had one equipment error per 100, we'd have we test 500 plus a day, we'd have five errors a day, not to mention you know, 20 a week and it gets worse from there. Um, so, any final remarks? I would say at the end of that, if there's a Q&A and you have questions and for some reason you can't stick around at the end of it, shoot us an email. Yeah, perfect. Just to add to that, because I know I being someone who's not an assigned, a scientist by trade, um, it can be a lot of daunting stuff listening to someone like Bruce and trying to understand exactly what he's saying. So there are people here that can uh, obviously help you 
Understand that on a more human level, if by chance this human is not your level. Like me. <laughs> well, on that note, um, I'd like to thank a lot. I think we've gone actually a little under time, which is probably excellent. Give, we'll give part of your day back, but again, we found the Q&A and this sort of thing is as continuing. If you have questions on this topic or any of this testing, but also on anything similar, a lot of questions we get today on skip um, and how this translates in a skip. Everything you do in a test report, we can move to first an Excel sheet. We find Excel or Google Sheets is a more effective way to work on skip declarations. It's the way humans are used to it. Moving to iEuclid afterwards is really easy. We get so many questions like, well, what if I have a thousand products? The hard part is not putting them in iEuclid. The hard part is identifying the SVHC declaration for each product. That's the hard part. Once you can do that, especially once you get it to an Excel level, moving to iEuclid is simple. Even if in, people are like, well, what if they're all the same? That's super easy. iEuclid is cloning capabilities. You can clone one into another. It's really easy. What's more challenging is they're all different, which is possible. And the effort there isn't putting them in the system. The effort there is identifying what the difference is, creating their declarations, and then agreeing upon the declarations. That's also another challenge you can have. You're going to need to agree upon what you're going to say about yourself. If you're going to say you have lead or brass, are you going to say your product gives people cancer? Or how are you going to handle that? How are the safe use instructions going to be handled? Some products won't matter. Some products they will. So that's a big thing. If you have any questions about this process, whether what we did, about us, about of course the equipment, um, the way we handle complex products, or saying, well, my product's got you know 10,000 parts. So first of all, circuit boards are handled a little differently. There's a whole process for circuit boards, the small little parts on it. There's a whole way to handle circuit boards. If you handle circuit boards properly, the rest of the product can be very complicated, but often there's only so many parts. If you have extremely large products, it's like, well, I make a uh, a server the size of this room, there's a different strategy for that. You're not necessarily testing the whole product. In those cases, it's something that value. We bring the equipment to you, not right now in the current situation, but generally we bring it to you and we test representative parts to prove your process is working. A lot of what testing is, is not just to say what's in or what isn't, it's to show the national authorities you've done the work. So when somebody messes up, which human error is very, very common, there isn't any penalty for it. And that's a big part of it. You can do compliance in many, many different ways. And if your product turns out to be compliant, it doesn't matter that much how you got there. But if it turns out to not be compliant, human error, design flaw, whatever, all the authorities care about is whether you've tested it. And not just everything, enough that's representative of the value of your sales in their jurisdiction. That's all they care about. So if you're compliant, you can have done any ways you want. But if you're not compliant, all they care is you've tested. And for Skip, we're gonna, we have another webinar next week, next Wednesday. That one will be live, uh, internet permitting, um, where we'll talk about how to handle Skip declaration when you only have partial supplier uh, data. And I have a huge number of legacy products. Or we deal with a lot of people who have like, well, I sell this part in packs of one, packs of two, packs of eight, packs of 12. How do you handle it? Or say, I have some SVHC data. Awesome, I need your product declaration. They say, well, we haven't done a product declaration. That's the mandatory part of SVHC. The SVHC requirement is not to collect data. It's to provide a communication to the recipient. And as of January next year, in the SCIP database. Having SVHC data means nothing for compliance. You have to have the product declaration. So if you don't have complete data or complete information, how you get there. So I have a webinar next Wednesday. We'll have a lot of details. How you do that in practice, like for real, not for theoretical, not for, you know, this is the software I'm, I feel like selling you this week. How you actually do it. So, thanks for hosting. Uh, we're happy hosting. Thanks for joining me, Brian. Thanks for having Appreciate me. It. Thanks yeah. for listening to us. And we'll be on for Q and A in a second. And I look forward to any of your questions. Again, just put them in the control panel, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. And talk to you again in a moment.